uh, it can be classified uh, prima in, in different ways. So my, one way would be you have knowledge of what the system does, okay, and in most cases this is called deconvolution because you know the Poisson function. Or if you don't want to use that information, you don't know it, then the approach is called blind deconvolution, in which case you're also trying to concurrently or jointly uh, estimate what the system does. So I talked about iterative estimation and optimization uh, last time, and, and that's how that's accomplished. Now, the other classification is whether you're assuming a deterministic model or a statistical model, a random model. So uh, the bottom line is that this problem, or uh, the inverse problem, has been solved in many different ways, and there is uh, a review here uh, that discusses a lot of these methodologies that were developed over the last 25 years or so. Um, and I, I just want to focus and uh, emphasize again that all of these methodologies have reached some maturity and they're available you know, in commercial software packages. Uh, primarily, for the most part, they assume space invariants okay, of the system, which means that uh, as uh, it was discussed throughout the ICOM uh, school this week, um, that the response of the system doesn't change with where uh, your structures or input are located in space, right? So if I have a point somewhere in, in the object space and I have a response, which is the points per function, if I move my point, my, the response of my system will move, but it will have the same characteristics. So in that case, then, you only need a single points per function to do the inverse. Uh, what we are working on presently in the last three or four years, I guess, or a little bit earlier, <coughs> conceptualized that, but now we have the funding to do it, is to actually model the spherical operations that make the system space variant and, um, and, and, and do uh, new modeling and algorithms. So here, uh, I'm sorry, I went through this without setting it up, but it's the same data set that I showed you earlier after processing. And um, I think even though the logistics are a little bit difficult here, maybe you can appreciate that we have a higher dynamic range. And, uh, you can see uh, the structures, discern them uh, a little bit better. So um, as I'm trying to do these reviews, my graphics here might be a little bit out of order, but this is what I, how I motivated last time the depth variability because of the different imaging layers that have different refractive indices, and you know from basic physics we'll have refraction, and so there are uh, aberrations that take place, uh, and the one that we are fo mo mostly concerned about and focusing and modeling is the spherical aberration, which is depth-induced. As I image deeper and deeper into the sample, the spherical aberrations increase, and that's what makes the response of the system at every image in depth change. And so when we solve the inverse problem uh, here, we, uh, and if we want to do it as accurately as possible, we must try to use um, uh, all these change, capture these changes in the response of the system. And, and so we started from the beginning with uh, developing new models and uh, that will account for this change and new algorithms that can, uh, that are based on those models. So I'm skipping these things because we talked about somewhat last time, but if you have questions and if this is, you know, going uh, too fast and not meaningful, please stop me, okay? So what I, what I want you to get out of this today is to have just a basic uh, understanding about this optical sectioning microscopy, that it's a, a mechanism that we can do 3D imaging with a conventional light microscope by just refocusing through the sample. Um, so you don't have any uh, additional optics there other than the fluorescence microscope. Uh, but the, you, you, you then do a lot of post-processing in this case, you take your data and you process it in a way to uh, improve the resolution and get a three-dimensional image that is comparable to confocal uh, images and um, the name of our game is that we want to surpass uh, that 
in the presence of spherical aberrations. That, to restate that, in, in the presence of spherical aberration, our methodology should give better result because we're actually accounting for spherical aberrations where in the confocal microscope that does not get corrected unless there's some specific um, mechanism there to do so. Um, okay, so um, these are the respond the points for function the, of the system that I described last time, different um, reasons why uh, it will change with the depth um, and we are approaching where we, we stopped last time so again to recap this is a simulation this is the basic idea that here is the point and if you consider this to be at zero depth now we're increasing the depth so you see the point is the location of the point along z is shifting right and this is where the response of the system and you see that this response is also shifting, if you just look at the middle point of the, of the response, that's shifting, but it's also changing its characteristics, right, the shape, all right? If the system was space invariant, then this pattern will be repeated here, it would just merely shift, make sense? Okay, so, um, all right, so this is the application in collaboration uh, with uh, University of Tennessee Health Science Center, applying it to images from lung tissue, and I'll show you uh, again um, these images where there's a lot of interest in um, understanding down to the epithelial cell level the mechanisms that these cells um, behave in order for uh, wound healing to take process in the lung tissue. Um, okay, so, um, Modeling now becomes, um, as I mentioned, we went back to uh, rethinking the assumptions that were, uh, that were put in place at the early 80s, which was the space invariant. So this is the general model, and with the space invariant, um, which is captured by the points per function here, you, you, you only you, you can do this imaging with a single plasma function, you have the convolution in the girl, and it's much easier to solve this uh, problem. But uh, as I argued, uh, this is not uh, adequate when you have spherical aberrations present, and when, when does that occur? When you have a sample that's thicker, okay? So if, if, if what is thick is kind of debatable. But <coughs> For structures that are maybe 10, 20 micrometers thick, the space invariance, the convolution approach, and deconvolution methods seems to be adequate. But when your structures become thicker, or the refractive index difference is larger. So there are two parameters, right? The thickness and the refractive index difference. Then this assumption breaks down. So, um, this is what uh, then we decided to do. And this was a, a something that we conceptualized a long time ago, but now we're uh, able in the last few years to really apply it. Um, to initially make this problem tractable, uh, we um, took the, uh, the, uh, the idea that we can perhaps uh, look at the at different sub-volumes, okay, in the object space, so consider this as being your the object that we're studying, and we're gonna uh, fragment it in sub-volumes. You, you see here is little slabs, or I call them the strata, and they're non-overlapping, okay? And the idea here is that if I break my object in this sense, I can then mathematically represent it as the sum of this strata, right? Uh, where S sub M of X is each one of these blocks. And capital M is the number of strata, and I can um, decide how many of these strata I'm going to consider, depending on the dimensionality of my structure. Uh, the idea here is that um, the, the size of this, the thickness right, of the strata is important. And I choose it so that imaging within this depth or thickness will approximately be space invariant. Okay? So the idea here is to um, try to approach or solve a space variant or depth variant problem 
with a small, with a, a lot, excuse me, smaller space invariant problems. Okay, this is something that is motivated from astronomy that was uh, applied there uh, earlier. So uh, then, if uh, if you consider now this representation, but much I, I'm making this cartoon smaller. This is the strata, and there are two depths of significance that bound my z sub n to z sub n plus one that bound the strata, and so. To characterize the image, right, of each one of these strata, um, we uh, need two points per functions defined at this imaging depths, the two imaging depths, and we model the image as the interpolation of two convolution operators. Okay, so essentially, then, in mathematical terms, if I choose m capital uh, capital M, excuse me, number of strata, I have, I can define a sequence of depth variant points for functions at different uh, depths z sub m, I have points for function, a three-dimensional response to my system, and then for each stratum, I can write the intensity in the image as the sum of two convolution integrals, okay? Uh, with, so S, is, S sub m is a stratum, and h sub m is the points per function at depth z sub m, and h sub m plus 1 is the points per function at depth z sub m plus 1. And they're interpolated, so this a here is the interpolation uh, constant. So if I can have the image for every stratum, since uh, uh, the superposition holds, I can then characterize the intensity in the three-dimensional image as the sum of all these images, which I represent here. So now I have a complete imaging model, which is stratum based, okay? So I have my, these two equations, define the stratum based model, and so if I give, if I give you an object, uh, you, you know, you can go program this and um, give me the image, right, of this object, with this approximation. The larger I pick M to B, right, the better the approximation, right? I can, if I, if, I, if, I, if I have computing resources and I make M really large, I'm going to be uh, coming closer and closer to uh, capturing the, all the, the, throughout the volume uh, and, and come to a, a very nice depth variant model. Um, so here's some simulated images. B, C, and D are simulated images. Uh, remember what I mentioned last time, we're looking at 3D images, but I'm showing you sections of these images, right? And, and so these are in the X, Z, so uh, I'm not a very good cartoonist, but here we go. Uh, you have your volume, and this is X and Z, so we're looking at the side view, right? Um, this is, a me Oops. Excuse me. this is a measurement, the first A is from a, a 4 micrometer bead, uh, we know it's refractive index and uh, 1.59 and we're using an oil lens which has a uh, refractive index of 1.515 so there's difference in the refractive index there and so you see that this image is not uh, symmetric uh, along Z which is the indication that the presence of spherical aberration. And in the simulations here, we vary um, the depth, these, these numbers that you see at the top, 10 to 14 micrometers, that's the depth that we consider to uh, compute the Poisper functions. And we vary that to, in order to uh, kind of reverse engineer to see um, how, it, you know, how to capture what we see in the measured data here. So we've done six different simulations, and then we, we looked at them in a different way, and here I show you profiles along this arrow from the simulations and the measurement. So it's a little bit hard to see, but the measured data is the one that's this blue kind of uh, sitting inside the uh, of all the curves, and it's a little um, jacket here. And um, you see that um, 
you know, we do a fairly good job in capturing the overall shape. We're not doing a good job matching what's going on on this side, so there's some other phenomenon there. Nevertheless, we picked one of the simulations that we considered, you know, uh, the best, and I'll sh show you, um, you know, later on um, results by processing the simulated and the measured image. So, uh, so the first part of this, you know, returning to the idea of computational imaging is you develop a model and then you evaluate it, right? So this step that I showed where we, you know, you write the software and you compute uh, the image, the predicted image, then you, you have a test sample, like in this case, you know, we got, we purchased the four micrometer B, we made the measurement, and then over here in the simulation, we created a four micrometer sphere, <coughs> and we used our model to validate or to evaluate and validate the model. So that's the first step that goes on here, is to check the model. So now um, there is the, the part where we develop the algorithm and then we're going to evaluate the algorithm. Um, okay, so the, the problem that we're trying to solve, stated a little bit more formally here, is that we, we're given measure data that we're representing it as samples of um, what the continuous function would be. So this is I sub s, uh, is a sampled function, because we don't observe it everywhere, right? We only observe it at discrete points in our image. And then there is some uh, uh, noise, and due to the um, system, we have uh, the camera um, that is a source of uh, noise, uh, among other things, but primarily, uh, the electronic devices. Now, uh, so given this uh, data um, and our modeling, we want to uh, estimate or compute the intensity of fluorescence in the underlying specimen. Okay, so um, the, the one approach uh, that makes sense is that, okay, I have a model and I have data. And so if I can uh, in some way quantify the difference between the two, a discrepancy measure, and there's uh, at least two that I mentioned here, and you see the equations, then I can um, solve this problem by trying to minimize this difference between the data and the model, right? And if I can find estimate parameters that that when I, when I put them in my model, my model prediction matches my data completely, then I have a solution, right? So that's, that's the basic fundamental approach for a solution. And so um, that goes along describing very well the deterministic approach. And earlier on, um, one of these uh, methods that um, we have developed, we call it the regularized linear least squares reconstruction, is one that minimizes the least squares error in our uh, uh, between the model and the data, and it's also providing some regularization. So I spoke a little bit about regularization last Monday, which is the mechanism to uh, control or to avoid the instability um, of the solutions due to the ill-posed nature of our inverse imaging problem. Okay. And then, um, in terms of a statistical framework, if you recall last time I, I talked about the maximum likelihood approach, where there we maximize the likelihood of the data in a probabilistic sense, and we solve that problem with the expectation maximization algorithm. Um, and I show two references here. Uh, this earlier reference by Cochello uh, is the expectation maximization algorithm based on the space invariance condition and then uh, the depth variant expectation maximization algorithm is the one that I'm going to describe here, which is based on the strata model that I just described. Okay? Um, so, I meant, again, there are several algorithms in terms of this class, in this class, there um, only you know very few in, 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 in the 
the idea of using depth variant approach. But I'm mentioning these three because I'm going to be showing you results from these three. Okay? So this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, or it's not meant to just highlight our algorithms only. But, um, okay, so again, uh, there are trade-offs here. So these are iterative methods. This is non-iterative. So one iteration of this algorithm here takes as long as it takes to execute this algorithm, right? So there is a, a, a difference in the computation time because this algorithm, uh, you may need to execute, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of iterations. So what's, what's the size of the uh, system you have to invert, for example, from the first method? How large are the images? Yeah, the, the matrix size that you need to invert. Do you need to have a lot of memory? Yes, of yes, that's a good question. So the we have three-dimensional images, right? So. Um, Let's say 256 cube would be a very, you know, <coughs> the, the minimum, mm -hmm. but meaningful images would be larger. And so um, then you have the, the points for function yeah. kernel, or, and, and so these can become rather large very fast, yes. And um, so in terms of, uh, and then as you move down to this algorithm where you have multiple points for functions, right, 10 or 20 or however many, then the requirements even grow, you know, linearly by the number of strata that I mentioned, you know, so if I, it, it, it scales linearly by capital M. So, um, so this is another reason why, uh, you know, it's only in the recent years that we have been able to do a lot of these computations. And, uh, but, um, you know, as time moves on, um, that, you know, that, that, that concern, you know, is not there. So we always try to make our development <coughs> theoretically um, to make sense with the mathematics in the hopes that we're going to eventually be able to compute these things, right? And we are now. So, but um, there's definitely a, a, a big speed advantage here between the approaches but, um, but we'll see what also the trade-off is with respect to the results you're getting. Okay, so I showed this last time about uh, the, uh, why Poisson process is, makes sense for fluorescence microscopy, so let's skip that, and this I showed you last time. <coughs> and this was in the uh, previous, uh, in the first lecture. So we, we have now um, one thing that is, Order. Why isn't there? Excuse me, let me just fast forward a little bit because I don't. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's not out of order. I just wanted to show you, but it, uh, first, um, so I talked about different things, right? Let me back up a little bit. And in terms of the forward model, I talked about the different approximations and I showed you results. And so now I'm going to start the performance analysis with just the original, the first algorithms, the algorithms that were dependent on space invariance, the ones that use just the Poisson function, okay? Um, so we created a test sample which consisted of a 10 micrometer polystyrene bead which uh, only has fluorescence in the outer layer. So in fact, it's a fluorescence ring, okay? And it's um, embedded in an optical cement, and which was then cured with UV light. So this was very stable. And this is the cover slip. So the bead is on the cover slip. Then you put the optical cement and um, cure the whole thing. And then this is the lens here. Uh, we used the 40x 1.0 and A oil immersion lens. So there is the oil layer over here. So this is the 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 whole. Uh, imaging layer system, and we uh, acquired three-dimensional volume with the optical sectioning method that I showed you. And here you can see uh, images of these um, sample in two planes: the XZ plane, right, and also the XY plane. So we have the two sections here, and you can see. 
again, uh, this was something that it was discussed in other lectures as well, that the microscope, the white field microscope, has um, anisotropic resolution, right? In lateral, in the XY plane, um, what you see here in the middle of the volume, which is the best focus, let's say, you see the scale bar is 10 micrometers, so this is approximately 10 micrometers in diameter B, which is what you expect, right? But when you look at the side or the axial view of this volume, you see this stretched football, right? And uh, if you consider with respect to the dimensionality here, it's almost 20 micrometers, maybe 18 micrometers um, in length. So, so you see the distortion uh, in the data that you get with this microscope. Um, so the, here's the schematic of the, the test object, right? And you see here the measurement again repeated. This image size uh, is 128 cube pixels. And the first uh, result, or the middle column here, you see corresponding images obtained with the non-interactive method, the regularized linear least squares method. <coughs> and you see that it's done well in XY to um, reveal that this is a spherical sh uh, shell, right? That you see here in the uh, raw image, we don't, we, it appears to be like a uniform disk, right? But in reality, it, it isn't. There's no fluorescence in the middle. And after processing, we, we get that pretty well. And in the XZ view, you see that um, there is some change, some improvement, but we are still uh, getting an image that's elongated as compared to the 10 micrometer diameter, right? And that's the best that you can do with this uh, linear type of algorithm. So it takes more um, sophistication or more a richer model and more work to solve the inverse problem um, more accurately, as in the case of the maximum likelihood expectation maximization algorithm, which required here several thousands of iterations. But you see that the result in XZ, although it's not identical to the image in XY, it, it is a lot closer to having a spherical shell. Yes? So that's the, the, the point that I wanted to make here with this uh, test sample uh, to just highlight the fact that yes, you can get uh, a, a lot better result. So this result shows an advantage over this uh, more complex methodology, recognize that this takes more resources both in terms of memory and computations. Okay? Uh, so now uh, here's um, biological data from the maximum likelihood AF algorithm applied to, the, to very low light imaging uh, images uh, from our collaborator um, at NIH. Um, and I just wanted to show you that this is an, a methodology that has been used in meaningful ways. Different wavelengths, green and red. The bigger images are the um, process, the ones in the, <coughs> excuse me, Insert our after processing in three dimensions, but we're only showing you a single XY image. And then this information um, is overlaid, so and, and you see here red and green, and then a, a volume rendering uh, is done. And the, the, the goal for this study is to observe whether the two um, types of proteins that are um, stained with the different dyes, right, colocalized or not, okay? And you see this nice pattern here that they are not colocalizing, actually, they're kind of alternating. And here's another um, data set from the, the same uh, type of sample. Um, and again, this idea of um, creating the model and understanding, uh, asking, uh, answering questions with respect to colocalization. So this works uh, well. This, this is, of course, a, a thinner structure, and um, there are no concerns at this point about uh, depth variability. Okay, so as I said, um, for many, many years, this kind of methodology was used. 
And, um, but now we want to be able to have successful results with thicker specimens, and we want to correct, since we know, we know how to model this phenomenon, we want to use it and, and correct the images with it. So um, now I, I'm going to discuss how we use this strata-based model that I uh, showed earlier to develop a new expectation maximization algorithm. Um, and uh, it's based on the Poisson statistics and the maximum likelihood approach, but now uh, instead of using a single convolution operation for the forward model, we're using this idea. So um, it's an iterative method, so at every iteration I have, at every iteration k, I have my best guess or estimate of what uh, the object should be, and we have our program that computes the model, right? So we get a model prediction at every duration. And at every duration, then, we compare that model prediction to the measured data, okay? And that comparison is done by uh, dividing the measurement by the model prediction. And that gives us a ratio. That ratio is then uh, used in this sense. You see two integrals here that are like convolution in the gross, and they use the Poisson functions, and we say they're back projected, this, this ratio, this, this error is back projected, and it becomes the update to give a new estimate, a new solution. Okay, so now at k plus one iteration, we have a new estimate, and we start all over, we get a new prediction, we have a comparison, and goes on, okay? So note that we have for every um, little m, for every strata, we have two PSFs, right? So depending how many strata I define, then I'm going to have uh, m plus one points per function. So to do this, I need to have more than one points per function. Um, so uh, algorithm evaluation is done with simulations. Was was done initially with simulations. So I start with the computer-generated test object, a spherical shell, and I pass it through my new depth variant <coughs> imaging model that uses multiple points for functions, again, depending on how many strata I choose. I create the model prediction. Uh, this is the image that I've, I'm, I'm simulating that my microscope would give, and then this becomes the input to the new algorithm that has knowledge of these multiple points for functions and with iterations gives us back a result, an estimate that should uh, look closer to the truth and much improvement over the model prediction, right? As you see here. So to, we do this simulation to quantify performance so we can compare the, comp the intensity at every pixel here to the intensity in the true model uh, object and um, determine um, you know, how, uh, how well the algorithm is doing. So um, the, the, here are just some dimensionalities. I'm going to show you uh, more about this particular uh, setup. But this is a small uh, spherical shell, 2.4 micrometers uh, in uh, diameter, and um, we are assuming that it's in, a, in water. We're using an oil immersion lens, so there's refractive index difference. We use seven strata to model this, so we are using essentially eight points per functions. Um, and I'm going to show you results obtained with the depth variant expectation maximization algorithm that uses these eight points per functions. And I will compare them to the result obtained with the uh, previous maximum likelihood expectation maximization algorithm that we're now going to refer to it as the space invariant M. Okay, so depth variant M, space invariant M. Difference is that this one uses only one point per function, which is defined at zero depth, and so it does not correct about the depth-induced uh, spherical aberrations, okay? So, um, what I'm gonna start playing here is just a little pseudo-movie. 
you see here at different iterations the result or the current estimate of the algorithm. And over here in the, in the graph, you will see this I divergence, which we use as a discrepancy measure between the estimated result and the true object, okay? So if things are going well, what do you expect to see? That as iterations progress, the discrepancy measure should decrease, right? And this image here should start looking more and more like the true object, the spherical shell, right? And there are going to be two curves here, one with the depth variant yet, the one that corrects for the vibration, and one for the spacing variant yet, the one that only uses a single time function. So kind of a red and a blue, but you don't really see them that well. So here we go. So a uh, number of iterations here, and you see how the algorithm progresses and is updating the estimate. Depth very EM discrepancy measure continues to decrease. We're approaching 10,000 iterations. We're going to go all the way to 100,000 iterations. And this is the result. Uh, at that point, spacing very EM started off OK, but then it can never fit the model to the data because it doesn't have all the information there. And so it's diverging. The, the estimate, you know, the algorithm it does, can't converge and it just takes a, the wrong turn, you could say, okay? So, um, here's a, a, now a comparison uh, where we have the result uh, in, for the depth, with the depth variant at 20,000 iterations and at 100,000 iterations. So it takes a lot of iterations, a lot of computation to recover the north and south pole of the structure, right? That's the difficulty because remember that's where we have the significant loss of resolution where we get the stretch along Z. Uh, but uh, eventually you're able to get it. And over here there are two results obtained with the space invariant EM. The first one is just using the Poisson function defined at zero micrometers 20,000 iterations and then 100,000 iterations. And you see how it's artifactual and then it becomes even worse. And then, um, since we can pick whatever Poisson function we want here, but only one, um, I chose a, a different Poisson function that's depth variant, okay? So it's defined at a, low, at a deeper depth. Uh, and, and you can get a different result, but again, it's artifactual. Okay, so this is the problem that we're trying to correct because um, there's commercial software, things were going well, and then uh, things, you know, images started having artifacts because the algorithm cannot account what's present <coughs> in the image, and so then uh, you can have uh, images that are not uh, close to the truth. Um, okay, so. There is clearly a trade-off here in this approach, and that is, um, remember the assumption was that we can take this uh, imaging in within each one of these blocks to be space invariant. In other words, the points per function must not change significantly throughout this little sub-volume. All right? And so, um, as I mentioned before, in this approach we need two PSFs for every stratum. So total number of PSFs is the number of strata plus one. And the trade-off is um, number of PSFs versus accuracy in the result. Okay? It takes longer time, more computations, the larger the number of strata is, but you get a better result. So um, there, there were studies performed. Uh, my student, uh, Ramita Maheni, got her uh, research or her uh, thesis done by um, doing simulations to investigate this trade off. And um, this was studied under different imaging conditions by looking at different refractive index mismatch, so using different lenses, air lens, oil lens. Uh, you see here the true object, simulated image, results obtained uh, using a different number of strata. That's what it's indicated here. So the bottom line here is that um, a small number of PSFs appears to be needed. Um, 
So there's a, a point where uh, you know you can, you don't need to include more is what the the message uh, was from the simulation studies, and then uh, again uh, more simulation studies were here. Uh, the the lens is kept the same, but the refractive index of the object was varied. Again, this support the same. Um, idea that uh, you, you see that if you use 11 points for functions, you get um, something that uh, it's uh, maybe acceptable. It's not as good as if you use 61 points for functions as you see here, but maybe this is acceptable. And it's uh, better than uh, using just uh, two points for functions. And certainly much better <coughs> than just using the previous algorithm that uh, only did not account for these uh, aberrations. So here's, we are returning back to uh, now, remember we're evaluating the algorithm with a lot of simulations, and this is the part where we transition from simulations to measurement. Applying the algorithm to measure data is a new ball game, and we do that with a test sample, okay? Something that we have an idea what it looks like, so the test sample here is a four micrometer bead. And I showed you earlier that we did simulations to predict uh, what the image should look like. So this is measurement and this is simulation. And um, we process both these data sets using the depth variant EM uh, in the same manner and we compare the result from the simulation to the result from measured data. So this is in the XZ plane, and this is a comparison in the XY plane. So this, this image is not the same as this image, the same uh, here as well. There's some di evident differences, and the actual bead, in fact, has a crack in it. Okay, we confirmed that looking at it under confocal microscope. So this aberration that doesn't show very well here is actually the crack of the bead. And I'll show you profiles along these arrows that, uh, oh, I thought I had profiles, well, maybe not. Took them out. But anyway, um, there's more consistency when you look at the actual values. So one thing that, it, you know, as you see with the contrast of different displays and whatever, it's hard to evaluate images qualitatively, so you actually have to look at the numbers and the intensity problem uh, to, uh, do a good quantitative uh, comparison. Okay, so um, after that step of applying it to measurement from test samples, then uh, comes the, uh, the actual part where you apply the algorithm to biological data, and uh, this is a simple um, type of cell. It's a human adeno adenoma carcinoma lung cell, and the staining uh, basically just shows, as the, the textbook cartoon shows here, the nucleus and the nucleoli, the smaller structures inside. This is a fluorescence image and this is a DIC image that shows the, uh, more the, uh, the structures. Uh, this one just shows the label, okay? So the question here is how many points per functions do we need to use in this methodology to uh, improve the image without artifacts. So we focus on one of these, right? We extracted one of these uh, cells to do the processing. Um, and this is before the processing, and this is after the processing with the different uh, approaches. This is the space invariant EM, uses a single pointer function, depth variant EM, two results with three pointer functions, and with 11 pointer functions. So um, you can see these two small spots clearly in these two images, not so in this image. And um, you know, it's really hard to say whether you know, there is a clear benefit using 11 versus 3, you know, also because we don't know what the truth is here. This is looking at the XY plane, and this is the same data set looking at the XZ plane. You see in the raw image, it's just a big blur. And then after processing, we get these structures here. And in, in looking at it in this view, 
the 11 points for functions uh, give a smoother result, where here with the three points for functions, we seem to have um, kind of an artifactual discontinuities occurring. Um, so this was one of the earlier studies, and to con validate further whether this result that we're computing um, is correct, we use an alternative approach based on structural illumination microscopy that I will discuss in, in the next lecture, um, which does, um, it's a completely different methodology, right? And, and so um, it's a good way to confirm, and we see we were happy to see that the two structures that we uh, reconstruct well and the delineation of these structures matches with this alternative approach. And we were also happy to see that we have uh, achieved an image with better signal to noise ratio than the image here, which uh, this is a characteristic of this approach that I'll discuss that has lower signal to noise ratio. So that is more or less a validation uh, step of our result. And then we, of course, looked at different kinds of um, cells. Uh, this, these images come from the movie. I was trying to point out that there are two different cells in that volume. So <coughs> earlier on, closer to zero depth, there is this structure that after processing, we see more of the uh, fine structures and uh, later on, about four micrometers deeper, you see in the raw image there's the kind of a blur, a footprint of this cell, and then and a new cell developing. And after processing, you see that um, this cell is clearly identified, and the out of focus light is removed. And again, this is the alternative approach based on SIM that um, shows consistency. Um, with our result, and again, um, this is uh, uh, something that uh, it is uh, a work in progress. But uh, you know, we we continue to evaluate. But we again, we're happy to see that uh, we are achieving a, 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 a as you see a larger range of intensities here. That's why you see. Um, a better contrast in the image and less uh, noise. Okay, so um, I think that this is a good place to stop because um, I faulted these results in uh, in the other talk uh, and I kind of split it into two. But what I'm going to talk about next is uh, moving on to really the goal of our research, and that is applying this methodology to thicker samples, right? <clears throat> so what I've shown you so far, they're, you know, four micrometer beads or cells that are maybe 10, 20 or large, you know, around that uh, thickness. And so we've done some preliminary studies with lung slices that are 20 micrometers thick, okay? And this is, these images are from optical coherence tomography. Uh, different uh, type of imaging that va um, it was used to confirm the thickness of our slice. So it shows here about 192 plus minus 12 micrometers. And so this is now a sample that we've used to uh, acquire the images, process them, and then compare them to this alternative method that I want to discuss first in more detail before I do the comparison. So I think uh, we'll is the plan that we take a break now? Okay. So, um, are there any questions before we do that? Hello. Yes. So you basically you take uh, you have the images X Z and uh, your calculations. So X Z image is that the one you take using the control of the Here, you mean, or in general? So, uh, so everything that I've discussed is operating on a volume. Yes, I understand. But, uh, and, uh, but you compare two images like um, where, where you have Right. So this is these are X Y images here. These are it. so this is a volume, right? Yes, X Z. Right. So this is a, a whole volume like that, 
and we do the pro we collect the volume and then we do the processing in 3D and here I'm just showing you <coughs> a single image in XY and a single image in XZ. How, how do you collect <coughs> information from the volume? The acquisition? Yes. Okay, so the acquisition goes back to the beginning where we um, refocus within the object. Like uh, normally refocusing with the GS or something? Yeah, there is a, a Z controller in the, on, uh, here, it's on this side of the microscope, but, so there's a motor, a stepping motor, right? And, and the software here controls the movement of the stage, okay? So the, the stage will move up closer to the lens, so you start out by focusing, uh, you know, there, and then as you move the object, Excuse me, you focus rather in the opposite direction. You focus on the top and then as you move this, you focus deeper. <coughs> and that's how you collect the 3D okay. image. But you don't show comparison in your calculation versus a CPM confocal? No, not in, uh, I, I don't have it he here. Right. But there have been comparisons between computational Computational optical section in microscopy. So if you if you look at COSM, that's a, an acronym, right? And there there are uh, there is literature where it compares that with confocal. <coughs> and what I'm going to show you next is comparison of this methodology. And I showed you a little bit with this alternative method, the structural illumination microscopy, which is. Um, Giving a result again that is equivalent to confocal and in some cases better. Okay, so uh, I don't have a confocal instrument, so but I have this multi-mode instrument that can do the wide field and uh, structure illumination. Okay, all right. Good question. More questions? So we take a five to ten minutes break.